frankly, that, that's, an, that's an interesting one. Um, this is session number, session number seven of Introduction to Christian Doctrine. I'm Dr. John McMath, uh, and uh, today we'll be talking about the Trinity. Uh, I'm going to uh, launch us into this uh, into that screen here. Let me see if I can do this without breaking something else uh, expensive. There we go. Very well. Okay, it's actually working re relatively quickly today. This is uh, this is all good. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm expecting to take the whole hour uh, to uh, to cover this one. Uh, the uh, The doctrine of the Trinity can be a little uh, uh, daunting. There's uh, uh, there's reasons for that, of course, um, and, uh, and uh, we'll walk into that. Uh, the uh, uh, The early church had to struggle with the notion of the nature of God. They were confronted with the, the obvious fact that Jesus claimed to be God, claimed to be the son of God, uh, claimed to be getting ready to send the Holy Spirit, uh, and then went to the cross to die for sin and then was raised again on the third day. The resurrection was the... Uh, uh, the uh, the clinching argument in Jesus' entire ministry. Everything that Jesus had to say uh, was either true or false. Uh, if if he was a liar in any portion, then he was a liar in everything. He claimed that he was was going to be. Uh, uh, put to death and would rise the third day. If he hadn't come through with that, then none of the rest of it would hold together. The resurrection is the, the key to Christian theology. Because of the resurrection, Jesus has the authority uh, to uh, teach even new ideas about God. Uh, the Jews were unwilling to hear what he had to say, and they still are to this day, uh, because it's a new idea. It's uh, what we call novel. Uh, and the fact of the matter is Jesus has the authority since he is in fact God, and he demonstrated that. Okay, so that's, uh, uh, that's the argument here. Uh, the, the problem with uh, the, uh, the triune or Trinitarian nature of God is that it's a bit of a mystery. Uh, the uh, the term uh, Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. You'll never find it. It's actually a Latin word. Uh, the uh, the term Trinitas in Latin was first used by the Church Father Tertullian around 200 A.D. The problem is that the doctrine is certainly taught in the scriptures. There's our problem. Um, the, uh, the, the word itself doesn't appear, but the doctrine is certainly taught. There's no question about that. Uh, as a theologian, um, I'm going to ask you to believe me when I tell you that no theologian in his right mind would have invented the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, the, uh, sometimes non-Christians say that the, uh, the Council of Nicaea invented the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, and that's, that's just, a, that's a lie. Uh, and it's usually told by people who uh, truly have very little knowledge of history. I'm, I'm struggling with my green screen here, folks. Uh, I hate it when this happens. And now it has well and truly happened. <laughs> ah, okay, I'm just going to have to hope that it doesn't fall over while I'm trying to lecture. Sorry about that. No theologian in his right mind would have done this. The, the Council of Nicaea didn't invent the doctrine of the Trinity. 
they came up with language that would fit in a creed. Uh, the earliest fathers of the church, uh, and this is even before Tertullian, uh, struggled with the language. Uh, they, they first tried to come up with words in Greek, and later they came up with words in Latin uh, to, uh, to explain or to enclose the concept that was clearly taught by Christ uh, and actually is clearly taught in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. Uh, the, the scriptures themselves uh, give us uh, all of the information that God felt like we needed in order to, to describe and to comprehend uh, what is really going on. Uh, finding human language to say what is taught in the Bible is actually kind of difficult. Uh, and uh, the, the word uh, uh, Trinitas uh, is actually a word that uh, Tertullian invented. It means threeness. Uh, and there, there isn't another, there isn't any other use of this word anywhere. A trilogy is three books, but the books are three separate books. Uh, and uh, if I were to tell you that uh, it is one book in three volumes, uh, you, you could just look at it and say, but no, there's actually three books on your shelf. It's three. Um, Trinitas is, is a word that it doesn't quite do the job, uh, but is about the best that we have. Some theologians use triunity uh, to try to get around some of the difficulties with uh, Trinity. Uh, I don't think it makes much difference. Uh, I think uh, at the uh, at the bottom of this, uh, we have a uh, uh, we have a uh, mystery. Uh, the Bible doesn't produce a nice, neat, orderly definition. Simply assumes that everyone can clearly see the Trinity or triunity of God. Uh, the uh, the doctrine is certainly taught in the Scriptures, and yet at its root, there is a mystery here. There is uh, there is something that we cannot deny and yet that we cannot fully comprehend. So we can say that the doctrine is beyond the grasp of reason alone. In some way, God will always be incomprehensible to us. Uh, that is not to say that we can know nothing of God because God has revealed himself in creation and in scripture. And there's a much, there's much about him that we as uh, creatures can certainly understand, but there's also a great deal, probably an infinite amount that we cannot understand. In heaven, I believe we will have a better perspective, but God will always be beyond us. Uh, that's a good thing, uh, but it still means there are there are answers that will always elude us. Isaiah 55 is a good verse to introduce all of this, uh, where uh, the Lord says, uh, "For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways," declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. Uh, it's just the way it is. And uh, for us to insist uh, that, uh, that, the, uh, that God make perfectly good sense to us is, is maybe a little arrogant. <laughs> so this picture is uh, uh, kind of good. Uh, you've got a uh, uh, two hands there, let's assume that one of them is uh, God the Father, the other is God the Son, and out of the middle of the whole thing, here comes a dove, which symbolizes the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, you know, it, it, artists do things. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to heaven, uh, at least partially because uh, 
some of our an uh, answers will be more clear. Let's go a little further. There are some false ideas of the Trinity, false concepts, uh, what some would call heretical ideas. Uh, the, at the time, as these things were being developed back in the, the first few centuries, um, I have trouble uh, declaring people heretics when they were struggling with the same biblical information that I struggle with. Uh, and uh, they simply came up with a different conclusion. Uh, I think they missed some clues and they missed some points uh, that uh, uh, led them into a, a wrong idea. Uh, but I think in those early centuries, it's excusable. Monarchianism, which is sometimes related to modalism, right? and we'll, we'll, we'll uh, separate the two of them. But monarchianism is an idea that uh, God is essentially one. It emphasizes unity, but not the diversity of persons. The persons simply don't don't exist um, or are some kind of an illusion or some kind of literary device, but there is there is no threeness to God. There is only oneness to God. There's a, another view that is often used by, by non-Christians to criticize the Christian position, uh, which we could call tritheism. Uh, Christians are monotheistic. That is, we worship one God who exists in three persons. Um, Non-Christians typically have real difficulty getting their heads around that. Uh, and again, I don't blame them. I have trouble getting my head around it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a difficult concept, uh, but we do not worship three gods. Uh, there is a... Uh, uh, there's, there's a rational impossibility for there to be three gods uh, because the term God logically means supreme being. There cannot be three supreme beings. Uh, therefore, they have to be somehow uh, one more important than the others or one creates the others or something like that. Uh, and any form of tritheism uh, ends up failing. Uh, the, the simple smell test of logic, uh, it just doesn't work. Uh, you end up being polytheistic. If there can be three gods, why can't there be 26 or 104? Uh, there, uh, yeah, we, we simply lose uh, the, uh, we, we lose the, uh, uh, the essence of the thing. And uh, uh, the Bible obviously, very obviously, does not teach that uh, there are three gods. Uh, so tritheism is a non-starter. Monarchianism is a non-starter because the Bible clearly teaches that Jesus, the Son of God, will send the Holy Spirit. Uh, suddenly we're talking about three persons. Uh, are all three spoken of as God? Well, we'll see that in just a, just a moment. Uh, a third false concept is called modalism. Modalism is a little hard to, uh, to define uh, in, uh, in words. It's the idea that God is revealed in different modalities or different um, or looked at from different points of view and uh, depending on uh, which uh, uh, which side of God you're coming from sometimes he looks like the spirit sometimes he looks like the father sometimes he looks like the son but he's still one uh, the uh, uh, in the ancient church there was a heresy that we call uh, monarchic modalism which says God is, uh, uh, essentially one, but we see three different sides of him. Uh, it, it's all the same uh, heresy. 
uh, but this one is uh, actually very common today. Uh, I'll action for, uh, uh, typically find young people, college students, uh, who will admit that uh, modalism is the way that they have always explained the, uh, the Trinity uh, to younger children. Uh, and that's a mistake. Uh, one of the most common uh, illustrations that's given of, uh, of the Trinity is a modalistic illustration. Let, let me give you this one. I'm not going to draw a picture for you because it's too easy to see in your head, but visualize three blind scientists, okay? <laughs> and I know such a thing is pretty unlikely. But let's say I have three blind scientists who are led into a room to study uh, a, 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 an Indian elephant. So we've got a big elephant standing in a room, uh, maybe munching on some hay. Uh, and he's a, a perfectly happy elephant. And the three blind scientists uh, walk into the room and they can smell the presence of something in the room. And one of the scientists uh, goes up to the, uh, the first part of the elephant that he connects to. And uh, he's, he's got a hold of the, uh, of the elephant's uh, trunk. Uh, and uh, so he goes uh, back to those who sent him and says, why the Indian elephant is kind of like a big fire hose. It's uh, kind of rough skin, but flexible and about uh, eight inches around. It's a, it's a big fire hose. Another blind scientist walks to the other end of the elephant. The first part he comes to, and he grabs his tail. And he swings from the tail for a moment, walks back out and explains where the Indian elephant is something like a rope, kind of a hairy rope. The third blind scientist walks up to the side of the elephant. It just bumps into the side of the elephant. Uh, and uh, says why the, uh, the elephant is like a, an immense hairy wall. Uh, and all three of them are correct. They have simply bumped into three different parts of the same elephant. That's actually modalism. Uh, it's uh, the idea that depending on how you look at him, God sometimes looks like a father, sometimes a son, sometimes a Holy Spirit, but really there's only the one. Uh, and that ignores the, the biblical evidence uh, for the interrelationship of the persons of God. Uh, we're not looking at God from three angles. We're looking at God in three essentially different persons. And that's quite different. Uh, we'll go a little farther with that. Uh, and again, by the way, I have uh, left the chat room open. So <laughs> do, do ask questions. If, if I can make this any more clear, I will. A fourth false concept of the Trinity is called Arianism, named after a, uh, 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 a third century uh, church father named Arius. Uh, and I hesitate to call him a church father, but that's really what he was. He, is an, he was an important theologian under uh, Athanasius in um, uh, Alexandria in Egypt. Uh, and uh, uh, Arius uh, said uh, the relationship between the father and the son uh, is that the son is a created being. Uh, the, the son is like God in that he is higher than man, but he is a created being. He is therefore not of the same substance as God is of a different, similar, but different substance. Now that's a little esoteric. And yet that continues to be the most popular of the heretical uh, views of Christ. Uh, most, um, most heresies of Christianity have a Christological uh, fault. Uh, in uh, the United States, 
uh, we had a, uh, a group rise up uh, 150 or so years ago, middle of the 19th century called Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, who, who claim that uh, Jesus is not the same as God. He is a God, not the God. Uh, in uh, uh, the Philippines, uh, we have uh, Iglesia de Cristo, uh, which is also a kind of Arian heresy. Uh, and different in a whole lot of other ways, but basically an Arian heresy. Uh, the um, uh, Arianism is uh, probably the longest running of the Christological heresies. There have always been Arian groups around, uh, and they pop up at uh, different times and places in the history of the church. Uh, we, uh, we will sometimes find uh, regular Christians, just uh, a man in the pew kind of Christians who have never really thought about it, just have assumed uh, that Jesus and the Father are something different. Uh, this particular attack on the deity of Christ is quite uh, dangerous. Uh, it, it eliminates uh, the foundation for much that is essential in our Christology and in salvation. Uh, someone who is not God cannot be the savior. But we'll get to that later as we get into uh, Christology. Okay, uh, this diagram might be helpful or maybe not. Uh, the triangle with a circle in the middle of it uh, is uh, this is old. It goes way, way back uh, into uh, the early Middle Ages uh, and uh, is a way of explaining what we have uh, done here. Orthodoxy is the target we're after. We're trying to get right doctrine. Uh, and uh, the correct doctrine recognizes that there is unity, diversity, and equality. Uh, in the Trinity. Uh, so God is one, but God is diverse in that there are three persons in the Trinity, and the three persons are equal. So if you take the opposite of each of those straight lines, uh, you'll find at the, uh, uh, at the angles of the triangle, the opposite of unity is tritheism. The opposite of diversity is modalism. And the opposite of equality is subordination. Okay, by subordination, uh, we mean one person subordinate to the others. So God the Father created God the Son, who in turn uh, creates the Holy Spirit, perhaps. That would be subordinationism. Tritheism is the opposite of unity. It, it argues there are three separate, uh, but somehow equal gods, uh, which is a logical impossibility. Modalism denies the diversity of, uh, of God and says God is always just one, but sometimes we look at him from different directions and that's wrong. Uh, so if that's helpful, uh, there it is. <laughs> and, uh, uh, some students find this helpful, some don't. Are there any real good definitions of the triunity of God? Well, yes, uh, there are. Um, uh, some of them are better than others. Uh, this one comes from a, uh, a modern theologian. I think this is Charles Ryrie, but I've uh, I don't have the footnote here. We may define the Trinity as follows. God eternally exists as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each person is fully God. And there is one God. Okay, that, that says it, I think, fairly well. Uh, it doesn't explain anything, but it says everything uh, fairly uh, succinctly. Uh, the Westminster Confession says it this way. Uh, it's, it's a bit more difficult, uh, but I find it actually really helpful. 
there is one only and true God. But in the unity of the Godhead, there are three co-eternal and co-equal persons, the same in substance, but distinct in subsistence. Okay, we have to define some terms there. Uh, co-eternal uh, means that one God didn't create the others. Uh, uh, the, uh, the three persons of, uh, of the Godhead uh, are eternal. They have always existed. Uh, they cannot not exist. Uh, they are necessary and of the essence of being itself. Uh, uh, that leads to some other ideas that, uh, that we're going to get to, but the co-eternality of the Trinity is very important. Co-equal uh, means that uh, each person of the Trinity is equal to each of the other persons of the Trinity in essence or substance the same in substance. The, the substance of a thing is uh, the, uh, the essential matter from which that thing is made. Uh, without the, the substance or essence of a thing, it would simply not exist. So if we're talking about God, we're looking at his essence, that will include all of the attributes of God that we have already spoken of, eternality, uh, omnipresence, omnipotence, uh, 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 all, all, of, all of the perfections of God, the infinities of God exist equally in uh, each of the persons of the Godhead. So the same in substance, but distinct in subsistence. Okay, a subsistence is what each person in the relationship uh, contributes uh, to the others in the relationship and to the creation itself. So God the Father is essentially the the fountainhead of the spring. He is the, he is the source, uh, the eternal generator of all that is. Uh, he is the father, the creator. The, uh, the son is eternally generated by the father, uh, which doesn't mean that he ever came into being but he has that relationship. He is the redeemer. God the Father didn't go to the cross. God the Son went to the cross. Uh, uh, and, uh, and God the Son prayed to God the Father from the cross, two persons, uh, and yet the same in substance. I and the Father are one. How, how can he say that? And yet that's what he says. Same in substance, but distinct in subsistence. The, the Holy Spirit, of course, is different from the Father and the Son. He has a different ministry. And we'll look at that here in a moment. The, uh, the first real attempt uh, at uh, uh, a, a definition of uh, of the Trinity in creedal form happens in 325 AD. Uh, this is uh, the Council of Nicaea. And I have to give you just a little bit of history so that the Council of Nicaea makes some, uh, makes some sense. Uh, the Council of Nicaea was called by the Emperor Constantine, who was the first Christian Roman emperor. Uh, 320, 312 AD uh, is, uh, is the year that uh, Constantine uh, defeated his, uh, his opponents at the Milvian Bridge north of Rome uh, and took over the Roman Empire. Uh, and uh, he decided that he, 
uh, uh, he was uh, helped in becoming emperor by uh, none other than Christ himself. Uh, and uh, uh, under the sign of the cross, uh, he decided he would make the Roman Empire Christian. What he really did was to eliminate the persecution and to make Christianity a legal religion. Uh, over time, Christianity became the dominant religion in Rome. By 325 AD, it is very likely that uh, well over half of the population of the Roman Empire was Christian. Uh, that's, this is all church history. Uh, the, uh, uh, the persecutions had been a terrible thing. Leading up to Constantine, we have a period of roughly 20 years under Diocletian, where everywhere in the empire, Christians were being hunted down, uh, thrown in prison, exiled, sometimes murdered, uh, sometimes in terrible ways, uh, simply for being Christians. This was a bad time. Uh, and it's a time when uh, the scriptures were, for the most part, destroyed. Any copies of the New Testament that existed at that time were hunted down. So for us today, very few copies exist that date to the time before around 300 AD. Constantine took over, and he inherited an empire that was divided and really too big to govern. Uh, he moved the capital of Rome uh, from the city of Rome itself to Constantinople on the European side of uh, the Bosporus Strait in Turkey, what is today Istanbul. Uh, and there he established uh, the, the capital of Rome. Uh, or, and uh, Constantinople became a kind of new Rome. It was really a very big, very cosmopolitan, very rich city at the time. And the center of gravity of Christianity in the Roman Empire was, of course, still in Turkey, uh, somewhat in Greece, uh, Syria, uh, which is the whole uh, eastern end of the Mediterranean basin and North Africa. Uh, all of that territory was uh, heavily Christian and they, the earliest churches were there and most of the theologians were there and most of them spoke Greek. Constantine walked into the middle of this and he realized that there were some controversies over among other things, the nature of the Trinity. Uh, uh, Constantine was not a theologian, uh, but he knew that in order to unify the empire, he needed to get all of the Christian leaders together to talk this through and come up with some common language they could all agree on. That's what the Council of Nicaea tried to accomplish. Nicaea is a, a small town outside of uh, modern Istanbul. Uh, it's still there. You can still find some of the monuments to that, although people don't visit there anymore. Uh, uh, Turkey is today a Muslim country, uh, and uh, Christian places are only tolerated when they provide a, a good income to the tourist trade. And uh, Nicaea is apparently not, not as famous as some other places like Ephesus, which really are very famous. Uh, so the Council of Nicaea uh, was uh, composed of about 800 theologians. Uh, most of them were Greek. That is, they came from the Eastern part of the empire. There were only a dozen or so from the Western church, uh, which gives you an idea of the relative importance of the East and West at this time. The uh, participants at this council went on for, for many months, and they finally came up with the, uh, the original grand Trinitarian creed. And this is the council or the, or the Nicene Creed. And we'll just look at this briefly. This is Trinitarian. So we've got three bullet points. I believe in one God. Now, that's important. 
because Christianity is monotheistic. Okay, I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible. So one simple sentence uh, that says we are monotheistic. Uh, we believe that God is the creator of everything that is. Okay, there's the, the first paragraph of the Nicene Creed. Uh, simple, sweet. Uh, nothing more needs to be said. Uh, if we were going to be Jewish, that is essentially all that we would need. But we are not Jewish, we are Christian. And so we get the second paragraph. And in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, and then goes on to speak of a sinless life, death under Pontius Pilate, the resurrection as predicted by the scriptures. The main part of the Nicene Creed is this central Christological paragraph. And look at some of the things that, uh, that Nicaea insists on. He is the only begotten son of God, begotten of the father before all worlds. Okay, uh, the, uh, the begottenness is sometimes called generation. Uh, uh, to to generate the son is to um, uh, um, amongst uh, um, amongst us human beings we call it becoming parents. <laughs> okay, regeneration. We uh, 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 mommy and daddy get together and produce uh, babies much like ourselves. Uh, that's uh, that's how that word is used. Uh, the Nicaea didn't want to be confusing this. And so he is only begotten in the sense of his, his place as the heir. Uh, he is begotten before all worlds, begotten not made. Uh, he, is, he is not a created being. Uh, rather, the relationship of the son to the father is one of uh, uh, begottenness or of generation, okay? And that begottenness is eternal. That is, it has no beginning in time. Christ has always been uh, in a begotten relationship to God the Father. We sometimes call this the, uh, the doctrine of the eternal generation of the son. Uh, and it's, uh, again, it's foundational to the logic of redemption. Uh, if, if Christ is subordinate to the father, if he is a, a later creation, or if he was somehow somehow born of a mama God uh, up in heaven is a, a blasphemous idea uh, and uh, uh, something that the Bible certainly doesn't allow for. Uh, but any, any lesser idea makes him something less than God. That's the problem with Arianism. Arius taught Jesus is something less than God. He can't be really, 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 really God. He's got to be less than God. But Jesus is God in essence. He is of one substance with the Father. The, uh, uh, the Greek word for uh, being of one substance uh, it turns out to be a really important word. Uh, we pronounce it homoousios. Homo is uh, the same or uh, one, and usios is essence or substance. So to be of one substance with the Father means that uh, God the Son is identical with God the Father. They are of the same essence. 
no distinction. Okay, and he is this same Jesus who, by whom all things are made. So Jesus is the creator, according to the Nicene Creed. Now, of course, that's also according to the Bible. What the, uh, uh, what the creed was trying to do was come up with a way of saying what the Bible clearly said. And I do believe that the Bible is clear. Uh, but what the Bible clearly says is actually a very mysterious thing. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thirdly, the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Ghost. Ghost and Spirit, same word. Uh, the, uh, the Greek word is pneuma. Uh, and, uh, it, it just means a, a spirit. Uh, I believe in the uh, Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, which is very interesting. Uh, the, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son eternally. Uh, he, uh, uh, also has no beginning point. He is also, uh, uh God, fully God. Uh, he is the life giver, uh, which is uh, uh, interesting, uh, the, uh, the spirit of life. Uh, he is the one who spoke to the, uh, the prophets. Uh, so the, the spirit of God is particularly responsible for the inspiration of scripture. Uh, these are very important things. These are of the essence of godness. So the Nicene Creed is, uh, is primary. Uh, the Nicene Creed uh, lays down uh, the fundamental things that uh, define Christianity in opposition to first Judaism and then to all other possible monotheistic religions and then, of course, to all of the pagan religions in the world, uh, all the, the, the various polytheistic and atheistic creeds, uh, all of that stuff is obviously not Christian. And the, uh, Christianity is different from every other religion because of its Trinitarian nature. Okay. Now, it's going to take more than the Trinitarian doctrine to to produce full-flown uh, Christianity, but you cannot have Christianity without the Trinity. Okay, so what do we know? God is one essence or substance. Uh, let's look at some of uh, what the scripture says. Deuteronomy 6, 4. Uh, Hear, O Israel, this is the Shema, the central uh, doctrinal uh, recitation of Israel, the Jewish people today. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God. The Lord is one. Okay. Uh, I, I like that. Uh, and it's true. First uh, Timothy 2.5 agrees. There is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ. <laughs> One God, the man, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is God. Uh, that's clear in the New Testament. You believe that God is one, James tells us in chapter two. You do well. He goes on to say, uh, the devils also believe and tremble. Okay, so believing that there is one God does not make you a Christian. But you cannot be a Christian without believing that God is one, if that makes sense. You need to believe something beyond this, but you can't skip this step. The oneness of God is essential. Um, let's, uh, let's go a little beyond this. Uh, God is also three, okay? The Father is God. Here's 1 Corinthians 8. Yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him. Okay, so Paul agrees. There is one God, 
we are monotheistic. Uh, but the Son is also God. John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Uh, in, in spite of attempts by the Arians to corrupt this passage, uh, that's what it says, and that's what it means. Uh, in uh, uh, every translation that is properly handled, we're going to get something like this. Um, the Gospel of John was written to demonstrate the deity of Christ. Uh, and it starts off with this uh, a very Genesis 1 kind of a uh, kind of a feeling. Uh, uh, this is uh, the threeness of God. The spirit, of course, is also God. Uh, and what the, the, the common proof text for the deity of the Holy Spirit is here in uh, Acts 5. Peter said to Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira lied about uh, uh, selling some property and giving all of the money to the church. They only gave a part of the church or part of the money to the church. Uh, there's, there's nothing that says you have to give it all to the church, but there is something that says you shouldn't lie to God. Uh, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back some of the price of the land? You have not lied to men, but to God. And after that, Ananias died. Uh, later on, Sapphira came in, picked up the same lie, and died in much the same way. Not a good thing. So, uh, the, the Bible clearly teaches the oneness of God. We cannot and must not try to escape the oneness, the unity of God. The Bible also clearly teaches the threeness of God, and we cannot and must not try to escape the threeness of God. This is, in essence, the core teaching of the New Testament. Uh, at the root, this is what makes Christians different from everybody else. Judaism emphasizes the oneness of God. Uh, they are quite offended by the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, if, if you talk to Jews about the gospel, you're going to run into that offense. They, they really don't like that. Uh, they consider it a, a, a very uh, sinful thing uh, to do, to speak in that way. It's uh, blasphemy for them. Muslims, who are also monotheistic, they believe uh, uh, in a God named Allah, uh, define Trinitarianism, which is the essence of Christianity, as the worst sort of heresy, uh, which is to attribute an associate, quote unquote, to Allah. Allah has no associates. He is all by himself. Uh, the, this particular heresy is called shirk in Arabic, uh, and it's the very, very worst thing you can possibly do. Uh, anyone who uh, uh, claims that God has a son or an associate is committing a blasphemy of the worst sort. And that's one of the reasons that, uh, that Muslims genuinely dislike Christians uh, when, uh, when we try to teach Christianity, we're going to teach the Trinity, and that is for them uh, really, really bad heresy. So both Jews and Muslims agree uh, that they don't like it when we teach the Trinity. Uh, the rest of the world's religions uh, simply don't get it. Uh, Hinduism, Buddhism uh, really are very, very different culturally. Uh, and um, uh, they tend not to be horribly offended at Christianity, but they believe we're wrong because God isn't personal. God is a, a, a force or a power uh, that is shared with all of life and all of existence. And so it's an entirely different philosophical thing. Okay. So God is one, God is three. Uh, and we see the threeness of God in the creation itself. Creation is such an important doctrine. It, it, it goes all the way back. In the beginning, God created. And there was the spirit in verse 2, hovering over the surface of the waters. How about that? And John 1, 1, and 2. And the word was 
were, uh, was God. And without, uh, uh, without him was nothing created that has been created. I should have put the him in there. I should, uh, I should cut and paste when I do these things. Uh, the word was God. And without him, nothing was created that has been created. The Bible clearly associates uh, all three persons of the triune Godhead with the event of creation. In the Old Testament, Isaiah 48, from the beginning, which is the creation, I have not spoken in secret. From the time it came to be, I have been there. And now, listen to this last line carefully, the Lord has sent me with his spirit. Who is doing the speaking? Well, in Isaiah, we speak of Isaiah 48 as one of the servant songs. The suffering servant is going to be revealed in chapter 53 of Isaiah as none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's so clear that, uh, frankly, Jews are offended by the chapter. They have to come up with other ways of explaining it. Uh, but from the beginning, I haven't spoken in secret. Uh, from the time it came to be, I've been there. And now the Lord has sent me with his spirit. This isn't Isaiah speaking. Uh, this is Christ himself speaking of the Father who has sent me along with his spirit. Okay, we go on. So God is triune. Uh, God is not three or one. He is both three and one simultaneously. Uh, the Germans have a, a helpful term, uh, dreieinkeit, uh, which is three oneness. Uh, and we don't really have a word in English. I don't know if Tagalog has a word that would do that, but the Germans often have uh, theological words that are just exactly what you're looking for. And uh, dreieinkeit is kind of that, that sort of word. Uh, the, uh, the Trinity is a tri-unity, which is why some theologians speak of the tri-unity of God. Uh, Christians are monotheists who worship a triune God, a single God who is dreinkite, who is three in one. All right. So how do the... How do the three persons of the uh, uh, Trinity relate with one another? This chart may help a little bit. The Father is not begotten, nor does he proceed. Begotten and proceed are two words that are used in the New Testament for the relationship of the Father to the other persons of the Trinity. The Father is not begotten. He does not proceed. But the Father generates or begets the Son. For that reason, the Son can be thought of as eternally begotten. Okay. Begotten is a biblical word. Uh, it's used in, the, in a technical theological sense to describe the father-son relationship in the Trinity. It does not mean uh, that uh, uh, Jesus had a, uh, uh, had a creation date or a birth date. Uh, there, the only begotten phrase uh, describes the uniqueness of the relationship. It, it, the analogy is to human birth, but it's definitely not the same thing. We don't actually have any human language to describe this relationship. Uh, so generation or begottenness is, uh, is the word that we have chosen to use. Uh, firstborn. In Colossians 1.15 and Hebrews 1.6 uh, is like only begotten. Uh, and it again doesn't imply sequence. Okay. Uh, so the father is not begotten, nor does he proceed. The father generates the son. The son is eternally begotten. But 
the Holy Spirit eternally proceeds from the Father and the Son, uh, which is interesting. Uh, this is uh, uh, just what the Bible teaches. It's the way the word proceed is used. Uh, and the, the procession of the Holy Spirit uh, is, uh, uh, again, like the begottenness of the Son, it is an eternal truth. The Spirit eternally proceeds from Father and Son. And so you get a triangular relationship among Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, a note here, just for the sake of completeness, in the Eastern Church, Eastern Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Syrian Orthodox, Coptic, and whatnot. Uh, the uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the the Son is generated by the Father, and then the Spirit proceeds from the Son, only from the Son. And so instead of a triangle, it's uh, three circles uh, stacked one on top of the other. The Father generates the Son, from the Son proceeds the Spirit. That's the major difference uh, between the Eastern or Greek Church and the Roman or Latin Church. Uh, you know, we Protestants have our roots in the, the Western Roman Latin Church. Uh, so we have, uh, we have held to this triangular pattern. Uh, in defense of the triangular pattern, this is the way the Bible actually speaks of the relationship of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I, I believe we're right on this one. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think it makes all that much difference. <laughs> Procession is this theological term. Uh, and, uh, John 15, 26 is, uh, is a good one. When the helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness of me. The word send is what you do with someone who is going to proceed from you. Okay, the procession is, uh, is, is the movement from one place to another. He it proceeds from the Father, he also proceeds from the Son. Uh, the Spirit is not begotten by the Son or by the Father. He is sent or proceeds from the Father and the Son. Okay, uh, a little more. We'll see how much farther we can go here. Uh, we need to define a couple of terms that are used a lot. The ontological trinity uh, is uh, from the Greek word ontos. And it describes what God is in himself, uh, in essence, or in his being. Uh, God's e eternal intra-relationality tells us something about who God is. So the idea of the begottenness of the Son and the procession of the Holy Spirit uh, theoretically tells us something about who God is, okay? Uh, a term that's actually much more important to us is the economic trinity. Economic has nothing to do with money. It has to do with uh, uh, the, the visible outward rules by which a relationship uh, exists. Uh, the, the word dispensation comes from this, but it's uh, the economic trinity refers to the arrangement of God's affairs for man's salvation, uh, specifically the incarnation, but uh, the, the events related to uh, God's uh, working with his creation for the redemption of mankind. Uh, and we see uh, descriptions of the relationship of the Trinity as they exist for the sake of uh, creation. Uh, scripture is a lot more concerned with this aspect of the Trinity than with the architecture of the Godhead. So we can think of the economic Trinity uh, in a number of ways. Uh, some say that uh, uh, God is uh, uh, the Father 
uh, uh, being a relational by seeking us out. So the father is seeking whom he may save. Uh, the son uh, does uh, uh, the way making, the bridge building in the relationship. And the Holy Spirit uh, provides the power for a saving relationship. Okay, that kind of says it. Uh, let's look at another example. Uh, like a mountain stream, the Father is the font of being. He is the originating cause, the personal source, and creation, revelation, salvation. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Son is like a scalpel in the hand of a skilled surgeon. He is the instrumental cause, the personal agent in the creation and revelation, salvation. Uh, the spirit is like the wind filling the sails of a great ship. And these days, there aren't very many great ships left that actually use the wind, but they're great fun. The spirit is the dynamic or powerful cause. And he is the personal power in creation, in revelation, and in salvation. So we can think of that as the, the elements of the outworking of the Trinity in the created universe. Put that all together. That is the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, it is something we must be constantly reminded of. I believe that as uh, pastors and teachers and church planters, uh, we have a duty uh, to uh, remind our people of the, uh, of the essence and of the work of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, uh, uh, we don't need to hammer on it, but we need to our people need to be reminded and new Christians as they come into the work need to know uh, that uh, as Christians, we are Trinitarian. Uh, we, we believe in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our, our music should reflect that. Uh, the readings that we choose should reflect that. Uh, the posters we put up in church should reflect that. Uh, the, uh, the Trinity is uh, basic to who we are. So uh, it's a difficult doctrine, uh, and it's not a trivial doctrine. Uh, it is actually a, uh, a shorthand for who we are at the essence of our Christianity. Uh, and uh, frankly, it is one thing that uh, holds all Christians together. I believe you need to, be, uh, to hold to more than Trinitarianism in order to be born again. Uh, but without the Trinity, uh, you cannot uh, you, you cannot be Christian, at least not theologically. Uh, God can save you without your understanding of, uh, of the Trinity. Uh, but when it is introduced, uh, all, all believers hold this. Uh, so that's the Trinity. We're going to leave that off for now. I, I, hope, uh, I hope that that was of, uh, of some help. Uh, when we get together again on Wednesday, we're going to do uh, an hour's lecture. Uh, we're, we're going to introduce uh, Christology. As our Christology continues some of the difficult material, as it continues to be uh, hard stuff, uh, but it uh, is uh, uh, closer to uh, the core of uh, what the New Testament teaches. Uh, Christology is also some of the most controversial stuff in church history, uh, and uh, many of the uh, many of the main heresies and many of the denominational distinctions within Christianity line up around uh, Christology. So we'll hammer on that. It'll take uh, uh, several days to work our way through Christology. We will see you again on Wednesday. I look forward to that. Okay. Bye-bye to everyone.
Oh, Everybody we love y'all. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, bye, you guys. Thanks for coming. Good to see everybody. Good night. Thank God you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, all. Bye bye, Oscar. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye.